Okay, should be possible to see this now. The purpose of the exercise that you just did was to understand the difficulties of writing a good locality description. Some of you, as soon as you received your description, said, what? How do I do this? How do I georeference this? So the point of this presentation is to try to look at all the details of how to write a locality description and make it easy to georeference. And probably you'll have some experience now, having seen some for in real life. So, there are many possible parts to a locality description. What you had in the exercise was a verbatim locality description. Just the text part. Because I said, no, you cannot use coordinates for the exercise. In the real world, you may have a combination of all of these things. A description, and an elevation, and coordinates, with datum, if you're lucky. Even perhaps GPS accuracy, extent, and a reference, like where did the information come from. Those are all possible elements of what you would have coming to you. So, what we really want from a good locality description is that it fits all of these characteristics. That it's very specific. Some of the descriptions that you had, I noticed when people were georeferencing, they said, well, it could be here, it could be there, it could be there. That creates a very large uncertainty overall. It's not very specific. Succinct means that it's short. It doesn't go all the way down the page. Because if you're an entomologist, your page is this big. You don't have a lot of space to put the locality. So you want to get the most out of the space. It's very important then that this should be succinct, short, brief. And yet, you want it to be unambiguous. There is not more than one possibility. Finally, you want it to be complete. It's great if you follow all of these other characteristics, but you don't give the whole description. Somebody will never find the place if it's not actually a complete description. You want it to be accurate. What do I mean by this? Here's a perfect example of being accurate. Or not being accurate, rather. I'll pick on the herpetologists again. They like to drive around in their cars, and they like to pick up animals from the side of the road. They stop, they get out of the car, they pick up the animal, they take a GPS reading. Some of the more advanced herpetologists get out of their car and walk. Some of the more advanced herpetologists put down the bottle before they get out of their car and walk. <laughs> Strike that one from the video. <laughs> Some of the more advanced herpetologists get out of the car, and as long as they have enough beer, they will walk somewhere. <laughs> If they have a big backpack, they can go a few kilometers. If they don't have a big pack, backpack, they can go a kilometer. But what I have seen often is they get out of the car, take out the GPS and go chink, and then they walk. And everything they collect is from the car, not from where they went. So they're being quite succinct, they're giving a GPS coordinate specific, they say exactly where they were on the road, unambiguous, exactly where they were on the road, complete, yes, but it's not the right place. That's not where the animal came from. And then precise is just what we were talking about, that when that GPS is clicked and you write it into the final destination, the database, that all of the precision of the GPS is preserved. We already talked about accurate versus precise, so we don't need to do that again here. So, what are the constituents of a good locality description? These are the characteristics that I think would make it easiest for someone to georeference well. It starts out with minimizing the uncertainty 
due to imprecise headings. If I say five kilometers north, as I said earlier, I described north could be over that way, could be over that way, or anywhere in between. It's not very specific. So how can we do better than that? One way is that we don't use a cardinal direction, a vague cardinal direction. Instead, that we go along a path. Let's go north on some road. That way, we're not going off the road. The road constrains what we mean by north, and it's very specific. It's not over there, and it's not over there. It's on the road. It's one way. The other way always works, even if you don't have roads. And that is that you use two orthogonal directions, east and north, or west and north, something like that. And then when you provide both of these, you're saying, as a recipe, let's go five kilometers north and three kilometers east. The directions are precise. It's exactly north and exactly east when you put them together this way. Because you're going on a grid. So that reduces the uncertainty to, to the direction to zero. Whereas otherwise, it's a big uncertainty, and the further you go, the bigger it gets. So that's a really good way to reduce it, to use a formula that uses a path or orthogonal distances from some named place. The other thing is to use only one reference point. I saw some descriptions that described the place from three different locations. It's so far from this thing and another distance from that thing and another distance from this thing over here. That's hard to deal with because what if they don't give the same answer? Which one's right? So better if your reference is just a single point and that that single point is small. Now some of the, all of you now have seen Zigzag Island. Zigzag Island is big. If I use Zigzag Island as my reference point, then my extent is big and my georeference will be big to accommodate all of that uncertainty. Some of the other ones use the peninsula and the northeast. It's just part of the island, so it's smaller in extent and the overall uncertainty when I reference the peninsula will be less than if, it re if I reference the entire island. Some others used zigzag point, which was a, just a little spot on the end of the peninsula. And it's on the map, so that's very small in size and a very good reference point because of that. The other characteristics are these two. The first of which is that the place that you reference is stable in position and size over time. What do I mean by that? If I use a town as my reference, well, already it's a problem because it's big, but there are two problems with towns, especially in Africa. One is that the size can change over time, and the other, more often in Africa than anywhere else in the world that I know of, a town can move entirely. You laugh, but you know it's true, right? So it turns out that the most common thing you might find in a gazetteer is a town, and it's mobile. You can't count on it to be stable in position over time. This is not true only in Africa. I have seen examples where a town is in a gazetteer from some date in the past, and the town is no longer there, it's somewhere else. Why? Because they put a dam there, and the town is underwater. The old town, the new town, is on the edge of the, dam of the lake that resulted. So that happens everywhere. Finally, the reference point should be something that's easy to find. If I go on Google Maps, there it is. That's a good measure of whether it's easy to find. 
So, to summarize it, what we really want is that the description does not introduce unnecessary uncertainty. My directions are very specific, my reference points are small, very specific, and over time they will remain the same. Some of you saw in your descriptions, and some of you wrote them, that you use terms such as the center of and near. It was actually fairly common to see that in the descriptions. Those are difficult to interpret. What does it mean to be near zigzag point? It's a little bit vague. We actually have rules when we georeference of how to interpret that and how to interpret center. But if you avoid that, then you avoid having to make such an interpretation. A note about elevation. You want to record the elevation. Many of you did in your descriptions. You used the elevation to say where on the island for the one that was on the island. And that was great because there was actually a topographic line of 1,125 meters and that constrained the part of the island quite a lot. The other thing is that having the elevation is often useful for analyses later on. And it's also a way to check the georeference, that everything is consistent. So it's good to add it. Interestingly enough, the elevation that you get from your GPS is not very good. It's much, much worse than the distance horizontally. And in fact, a much better way to get an elevation is either from a map that's super high quality, having a GPS position, or to use a calibrated barometric altimeter. Now, how do I know this? It's not because I read the theory until I experienced the problem for myself. I was sitting on a rock on a mountain in Chile with my GPS, and I was curious, how much did it change as I sat there? In other words, could I move myself without moving, just by watching my GPS? And the answer was yes. I could move four meters over there, four meters over there, four meters behind me, because of the accuracy of the GPS. Then I noticed what was happening with the elevation. I was only moving four meters this way, but as I sat there, I started to go up the mountain. And I went up the mountain a whole hundred meters while I sat on that rock. And I'm pretty sure the Andes are not growing that fast. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was not levitating, because the rock was with me too, and there's no way I can levitate a rock. That's when I realized I need to go read what's happening. And the GPSs are optimized for the horizontal distances, not at all for elevations. So beware of that. Finally, record the source of your elevation. Because it can vary so much, it's probably a good idea to say where it came from, whether it came from a map, from an altimeter, or from the GPS. And about the coordinates. Let me move my cursor. It's bothersome. This we haven't discussed yet. You might think, well, the coordinates can be very specific, and they can be very succinct, and they can be very accurate. Isn't that just the best possible locality description in the world? The answer is, if you can trust it, yes. But if you have a descriptive locality, like the things that we just wrote down on a piece of paper, then you have a way to check those coordinates. 